the last day of PCC. Uh, the first, um, today we start with the foundation session. And the first talk is on de-randomizing the Auschwitz to strong one-way functions. And uh, this is a joint work of Chris Puska, uh, Geoffrey, Pila, and Felix. And Pila will give the talk. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm Pihla, Pihla Karanko, and I'm going to talk about de-randomizing Yao Suite to strong one-way function construction. And uh, uh, as uh, we were presented, uh, this was a joint work with Chris Brzezka, Jean-Claude Couteau, and Felix Kofa. Uh, at least Chris is also here in the Zoom, so he can help me if you ask difficult questions in the end. Uh, all right. So we say that if is a weak one-way function if it can be inverted with probability at most one minus one over p of n for some polynomial p. And we say that g is a strong one-way function if the inversion probability is negligible. So this is the usual definition of one-way function. Now, the theorem by Yao says that if f is a weak one-way function, then this g that takes some long input x1 to xn times p of n, where this p uh, is from the weak one-way function definition, then this g feeds these x's into the weak one-way function and outputs the results. This g is a strong one-way function. Now, we are interested in whether we could have shorter input to g, that is, if you have the Yao construction here, uh, could you add some pre-processing function such that it makes the input to G shorter? In particular, if the input to the weak one-way function is of length M and this X is of length N, could we have N equal to some constant times M? Now, the result of our paper is negative, that is, there is no pre-processing with input length less than some constant times p of m. So the input here must be at least order of this polynomial. More precisely, we show that you cannot prove that such a short input g is a strong one-way function. And what proofs we rule out exactly? We rule out a big class of relativizing black box proofs. And our proof uh, is by oracle separation. So first, we have a p-space oracle to get rid of all possibly already existing randomness, uh, existing hardness. And then as the weak one-way function, we have a special random oracle that can be inverted on one minus one over p fraction of random outputs. And then we show that this kind of short input G can be inverted with non-negligible probability. The adversary against this G works as follows. So it inverts each of these Y's one by one, and it is successful in roughly this fraction of the F calls. So the adversary learns all but uh, this polynomial fraction of the x size. And now the interesting part of our proof is to show that when you know almost all of these, then no matter what this pre-processing function is, uh, this x is easy to guess with the p-space oracle. Now, this looks a little bit like secret sharing you know many shares and you want to learn the secret. Of course, in secret sharing, instead of this X, we would have some secret and the dealer's randomness. However, there is a result in secret sharing that says that the randomness and the secret together need to be long. So we were hopeful that you could prove an upper bound in our case as well. And indeed, we managed to prove that on average, average the hard Xi's have little entropy conditioned that you know all the easy Xi's, regardless of what this preprocessing is. This is because every Xi can
cannot have a fresh bit of entropy from a short X. So when we choose a random subset of Xi's, then the entropy is gone with high probability over the choice of the random subset. And then uh, when you know all of these, uh, it is very easy to get this X using the P-space oracle. I give the details of that proof in the long talk. And in the long video, I also discuss how this relates to other works. Um, thank you for listening. Any questions? Okay, any question for Pila? Let's see if there are questions from the chat. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like there are no questions. Thank you, Pila. This was a really great talk. It was really Thank enjoyable. You. All right, so, so then let's move on to the next talk. Next talk is on, um, actually, do we have children? Oh, good. Um, on three with separators and Jaws Garbley. This is a joint work by Chitan, Karen Klein, and Christoph Pietrak. And Chitan is going to give the talk. Chitan, we cannot hear you. Um, now we can. Oh, you can? Yes. Yes, now we can. Maybe You'll you have to speak, speak louder. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, I'm Chetan, and I'll present the paper on tree with uh, separators and Yao Scarbling. Uh, this is joint work with Karen Klein and Krzysztof uh, Piedzak. Um, our main uh, our result states that for, for the class of Boolean circuits of size S and tree with W, Yao Scarbling, which we denote by gamma, is adaptively indistinguishable uh, with the loss of security, which is exponential in the tree width uh, as to the O of W to be precise. Uh, so for concreteness, if one considers uh, Boolean circuits uh, that have constant uh, tree width, uh, we get uh, uh, adaptive indistinguishability with only polynomial loss. A um, couple of remarks are due here. So uh, what is tree width? Uh, it's a notion from uh, algorithmic graph theory which is uh, informally uh, a measure of how far uh, a circuit is from a, a formula. And uh, we will come to the, the, the details a bit later. And uh, secondly, the notion of security we consider here is called adaptive indistinguishability. Uh, this is weaker than the standard notion of security, which is adaptive simulatability. And we will see soon why this is the case. So adaptivity here refers to the fact that uh, the adversary uh, it can uh, select its input after the fact that it, uh, it has obtained the garbled circuit. Uh, so what was known about uh, security of Yaw's garbling? Um, the selective security was established by Link, uh, Lindel and Pinkas. And this was, they showed that uh, Yao is selectively simulatable and this uh, implies selective indistinguishability. And uh, this was followed by the work of Apple Bamatol, uh, who proved a negative result. They ruled out uh, adaptive simulatability of, of Yao's garbling. And so th th this was a, a, a corollary of a more, result, a more general result of theirs, which showed that if, uh, for randomized encodings, uh, which is adaptively simulatable, uh, your um, online complexity needs to exceed the, the output length. This is not the case for uh, Yao's garbling. But uh, Jaffa Golian Bex um, showed that you can bypass this uh, negative result by modifying Yao's construction a bit. Uh, uh, that is by deferring the, the output map to, uh, to the online phase. So uh, the, 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 the state of adaptive uh, indistinguishability had remained open and we uh, partially resolve this um, in, in, in our work. We show that it is indeed possible in some cases. Uh, uh, so I'll briefly describe our, the, the overview of our proof. So we, like in previous works, we do a hybrid argument and we, to get adaptivity, we use something called piecewise guessing. 
And in order to do this formally, we uh, uh, abstract out the hybrid using a, a pebble game. So our pebble game is a bit different from the previous works. And this is one of our technical contributions. And the main technical contribution is coming up with um, efficient doubling strategies. And for this, we use uh, the notion of tree width or separators. So, so what does this translate to? So uh, uh, pebbling strategies are, are, are by the, the second step, that they are kind of tightly related to the hybrids, the hybrid uh, argument and, and coming up with more efficient pebbling strategies for some measure of efficiency, they translate into better hybrids for for Yao's garbling. Uh, so, so this is what I would like you to uh, take away from from this talk, like the notion of separator and trivet. So, this is a very general uh, notion, and it is an easy, uh, it's a it's a useful uh, tool to have in one's repertoire. Uh, as so, a trivet is a, as as I already mentioned, it's a measure of how far a circuit is from a from a formula, for example, Boolean formula by definition have three with one. And what is a separator? Uh, a separator S for a circuit C is a subset of its gates such that removing this subset S and the incident wires, it, it decomposes uh, the circuit C into uh, sub circuits which are of comparable size. So for example, in this figure on the left, you see a circuit C and the separator for it is shown in between the dashed lines. And when one removes the gates, uh, the, the, the circuit neatly decomposes into two sub-circuits C1 and C2, which don't have uh, connections between them. Uh, how are circuits, uh, how are separators connected uh, connected to a tree width? This is uh, why a classical theorem of Robertson and Seymour, they showed that uh, any circuit which is uh, which has a tree width W has a separator of size, uh, which is upper bounded by W. Therefore, uh, this is an existence theorem. And how what does one apply this uh, existence theorem? So, so on a very high level, what this allows is to do divide and conquer. Uh, this is the main reason is because uh, the notion of tree width is a is is a monotonous property. So if you if you look at the sub uh, circuit of a cir circuit, the tree width can only decrease from its parent circuit. So what it allows you to do is uh, you take the circuit C, you decompose it using a separator S, and then you can keep on doing this process until you end up with small enough sub circuits. So if you are uh, if, if you are trying to carry out some uh, thing for the whole circuit C, you can uh, divide the task into carrying it out of the sub-circuits uh, given you pay for the separator S. Uh, since, uh, so the, so since the, 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 the sub-circuits that we get is not too big, uh, the depth of this, this recursion is, is, is also is, is bounded by log of S. And moreover, the amount of resource one uses per step is also bounded by the uh, size of the separator. Therefore, if the separator is not too big, one ends up with a nice divide and conquer strategy, which helps uh, carry out whatever task one wants to. And that's all. Um, yeah, you can find more details about the talk um, uh, on the paper, or you can look at the, the, the full video. Thank you. Thank you, Chitan. Are there any questions for Chitan? We have one question from the audience. And if you cannot hear, you can speak from that yes, side. Okay. Oh, you can come here to watch. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is uh, just a simple question. Do both parties need to know the tree decomposition to um, do this garbling? Uh, no, no. One just needs, uh, if, if one has an upper bound on the trivet, uh, if you look at the details of the paper, it, uh, it suffices. It, one we guess like uh, the the width, uh, the the separator, and then one, one can carry on. One doesn't need to compute the tree decomposition. Okay, and then uh, one more question: since we're already starting with circuits, so they're already um, you know DAGs. Does that mean like in general, like the tree width tends to not be that big for most kinds of problems people would want it to do? Um, not necessarily. So, so uh, I brushed some things under the hood here. Tree width is actually defined for undirected graphs, yeah, originally. 
but we use like a definition which is for directed graphs. Um, I don't think so. One could come up with uh, with circuits for which like the, the tree width is um, large enough. There might be like a small gap between the, the tree width for directed and undirected, but it's probably not significant. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions for Chitan? So I don't see anything from the chat. Thank you, Chitan, again. All right, next talk is um, Oblivious Transfer from Chapter Permutations in Minimal Round by Arka Rai, Michele Champ, Vipul Goyal, Abhishek Jain, Rafael Ostrowski, and Michele is going to give the talk. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thanks a lot, uh, Alessandra, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so the first thing we start in this paper is the notion of oblivious transfer. So I hope all, you know, all, all of you know what it, is, what it is. So basically we have a sender with two inputs and a receiver with, uh, with one uh, bit as input. And the aim of the receiver is to get uh, a CB uh, in such a way that uh, the sender doesn't learn what is the input of the receiver and the receiver doesn't learn what's the other input of the sender. And unfortunately, we know that we cannot realize this functionality information theoretically. And so what we can do is to rely on some assumptions. In this case, we want to consider the, case, the, the setting of computational uh, hardness assumptions. In particular, we um, consider the, uh, the notion of one-way chapter permutation. So one way to describe uh, what uh, these are uh, is through um, a set of algorithms. So the first algorithm is the generation algorithm that gives you um, the description of a, of a chapter permutation and some chapter. Uh, then we have an evaluation algorithm that basically we can use to take any value x and evaluate g over, over x, and we get the, uh, uh, the output, and this is easy to do. On the other hand, uh, if we just take a random element from the codomain and we want to com compute the inverse, this is hard. It's hard as, unless we have the chapter. If you have the chapter, we can do that easily. So one property that you might want to uh, add on top of your one-way chapter permutation is the property of certifiability, where certifiability means basically that anybody, by just looking at the description of the function, can claim efficiently um, whether G is a permutation or not. Uh, so what is the relation between oblivious transfer and uh, chapter permutation. So we know that uh, uh, in three rounds, if the receiver is semi-honest and the sender is corrupted, uh, we can use chapter permutations to, to realize the oblivious transfer functionality. However, as we will see later, uh, it is required for the chapter permutation to be certifiable in order for the proof to go through. And in a little work of uh, Katsostrowski of 2004, the others show that you can actually realize any functionality, but again, you need to rely on uh, certifiability of the chapter permutations. And this result is in the plane model and requires just five rounds, which is the minimal number of rounds you can hope for. This result was later improved by Ostrowski, Richardson, and Scafuro. Uh, where they showed that the same result holds uh, by requiring only black box access to the underlying chapter permutation. And now uh, what we ask in this, uh, in, in this work is whether we can remove this uh, requirement on the certifiability, right? And this is kind of a natural question if you look, for example, in other, uh, in other contexts. For example, um, we know that to realize non-interactive uh, zero knowledge, um, we just need chapter permutation. So uh, Bellar-Yung in 1993 showed that you don't need the certifiable property. And this result was also improved later on by, um, by Ganeti et al. So we asked whether the same holds in the case of oblivious transfer, more in general, in the case of two-party computation to realize any, any functionality. So before diving into it, uh, I just want to recall how the EGL construction works to realize oblivious transfer. So for simplicity, let's say that the receiver here has a fixed input one. And the idea here is that the sender uh, generates the chapter permutation. It provides the description of this function to the receiver. And now the receiver, for a, the input he knows, he samples a random x1, evaluates the function over x1, 
And for the input, he doesn't know, he just picks a random Y. Okay, so the idea is that he will compute these two values in such a way that the receiver knows only the pre-image of one of those. Now the receiver, the, the sender has the tractor, so he can invert uh, both Y0 and Y1. And so he will use the uh, inverse of Y0 as a one time key to encrypt uh, his first secret, C0. And he will do the same uh, for the second secret, C1. And he will send uh, those encryptions over to the receiver. Well, now the receiver, if the receiver is, is semi-honest, then he can only get uh, one of these uh, secret and he's happy. Uh, but what happens when the, the sender is corrupted? So if the function G is a permutation and the receiver has a way to certify that, then well, the receiver will be happy and he will engage in this protocol. And as you can see, if the G is a permutation, you can actually claim that uh, uh, the input of the, of the receiver is information theoretically hidden because the distribution of Y0 and Y1, basically they, they're distributed identically. On the other hand, if you consider a function that is not a permutation and that it's not certifiable, so the, the receiver cannot just abort, um, by uh, understanding that the function is not a permutation, then you have a problem. And the problem is that uh, you have some collisions in the sense that the two values, for example, the, uh, the, the function evaluated on two values gives you the same value. This means that, for example, the value y1, which is computed by, uh, by the receiver, can never, will never be equal to, for example, b1 or b4, right? because there is no value that is mapped to from x1 to, um, to, to, to the go domain, b1, b4. And on the other hand, y0 is randomly sampled from the go domain. So, I mean, b1 might be equal to any of those values, right? So, and this might give an advantage to, uh, to the adversary. So what do we do to solve this issue? Uh, we define and extract an encryption scheme that takes a simple description of the one-way permutation and a message M, and it returns a ciphertext. Now, if the function G is indeed a permutation, then any, any, any decryptor that has the trapter of G can decrypt. On the other hand, if G is not a permutation and it has a lot of collisions, then the message remains hidden. So that's how we modify the protocol. So basically the second round is now encrypted using this encryption scheme in such a way that we are in a win-win situation. So if the function is not, it's very bad, uh, it's very badly not a permutation, the, the sender cannot decrypt. But if the function is a permutation, then the sender can decrypt and we are happy because, I mean, it's fine that the sender uh, sees Y0 and Y1 because they don't leak anything about the input of the receiver. Uh, as you might have noticed, this is not uh, this is not sufficient to, to to prove the security of this because there might be less than exponentially many collisions, right? So, but we show in the um, uh, and we discussed this also in the extended talk how to amplify the security of this protocol uh, by using an approach similar to oblivious transfer uh, transfer combine, combiners. And uh, so we use a similar approach to realize an optimal uh, round two-party computation that realizes any functionality um, in the optimal number of rounds and that requires only the black box access to the underlying um, trapter permutation. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michele. Do we have any questions? Um, the Any question on the chat? Okay, so maybe I'll have a quick question. Um, this, in, this encryption scheme, it's a special one. And, and what's the idea? Yeah, so, so what's the idea of the encryption scheme or what's the idea of the... I guess, um, how do you use the information about the chapter to decrypt or not decrypt? Because I, ah. if I understand this should be a, yeah. So your construction is non-black box then in the trapdoor permutation? No, no, the construction is black box on the trapdoor permutation. So the idea is, uh, is that basically to encrypt, you just uh, use the, um, you take a value X and use 
you know, you evaluate uh, X over G and you get the hardcore bit of X, actually to be precise, right? And then you can use it to encrypt one bit, for example, okay? Yeah. So your cyber cybertext is like the hardcore bit of, uh, of this value, right? Uh, X and uh, you also send, um, you also send y, uh, y, right? And then the point is that if you have the trapdoor, you can decrypt it because um, you can, right? Yeah. But if the function is not a permutation, it's ambiguous, like how to decrypt it because you have the value Y, and then you try to invert it and you get two values. And then you don't know what is the right value. To right one. That's more or less how it works, yeah. But it's fully black box, yeah, in the, in the use of the, of the permutation, yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you. All right, let's thank Michele. Okay. Our next um, paper is the cost of adaptivity in security games on graphs. And it's a joint work by Tritan. Karen, Christoph, and Michael, and Karen will give the talk. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. In cryptography, we often define security of a scheme by game between an adversary and a challenger. And then Karen, can you speak a bit louder? A bit louder? Okay. Or yes, maybe thank I... You. Yeah. So what I said, in cryptography, we often define security of a scheme by a game between an adversary and a challenger. And to prove security of the scheme, we then construct a reduction that simulates the challenger to the adversary and tries to extract some information from this interaction that helps it to break some hard problem pi. And such a hard problem pi is very often defined through the security of some simple cryptographic primitive on which the scheme is built. We then prove that if the adversary breaks the scheme with advantage epsilon, that the reduction breaks the underlying hard problem with advantage epsilon over loss. And clearly, the smaller this loss is, the stronger the security guarantees we obtain for our scheme. In this talk, we only consider fully black box reductions. In many cases, it is significantly simpler to construct such a reduction if the adversary's choices were known ahead of time. We call such adversaries selective or static adversaries. In practice, however, we usually require stronger adaptive security where the adversary can make all its choices adaptively depending on what it learned during the game so far. In this talk, we will discuss lower bounds on the security laws against such adaptive adversaries for schemes for which selective security could be proven at only polynomial loss. The games we consider are multi-round games that capture several existing constructions where the adversary's queries can be considered as edges of a graph. One such game is called Generalized Selective Decryption and it was introduced by Panjwani in the setting of multicast encryption protocols. This is in a secret key setting, nodes represent keys and edges represent encryptions of secret keys under other secret keys. While this game makes sense for arbitrary acyclic graphs, in many applications or specific constructions, the adversary would be restricted to query other paths or binary trees. The next game we consider is the security of TreeCam, which is a continuous group key agreement protocol uh, that is currently discussed by the MLS working group. This is very similar to GSD, however, in the public key setting. And furthermore, the the adversary's queries are somewhat structured to form a tree. The next game we consider is the security of the pseudorandom function based on pseudorandom generators due to Goldreich, Goldwasser, and Mikali as a prefix constraint pseudorandom function. Here nodes represent seeds and edges represent PRG evaluations. And the underlying graph structure is an exponential sized binary tree. Finally, the last game we consider is the security of unidirectional proxy encryption schemes, where nodes represent public key pairs and edges represent re-encryption keys issued during the game. Similar to the case of GSD, the graph structure here is not fixed, but in most applications, the adversary would be restricted to paths or binary trees. So these settings are especially interesting. For all these four games and various underlying graph structures, we obtain lower bounds that almost match the best known upper bounds. Unfortunately, however, in the case of paths and binary trees, our lower bounds only hold for so-called oblivious reductions, where we call a reduction oblivious if it ignores 
what it learns about the adversary structure, uh, about the adversary strategy, and ignores this partial graph structure that it learns during the game. So it behaves selective in some sense. In the case where the underlying graph structure is a tree, we do not have to make this restriction, but we obtain lower bounds for arbitrary straight line reductions. And our final result for proxy encryption on arbitrary acyclic graphs holds for arbitrary fully black box reductions. While obliviousness is a rather strong restriction on the reduction, let me mention that all known upper bounds have been derived through such oblivious reductions. Our main conceptual idea to derive our lower bounds is to introduce a builder pebble game that abstracts out all the combinatorics behind our proofs. Here the builder represents the adversary and the pebbler plays the role of the reduction. We then translate upper bounds on the pebbler success probability into lower bounds on the security loss using oracle separation techniques. So we construct an ideal basic cryptographic primitive. In the case of GSD, this would be an ideal in CBA secure secret key encryption scheme. And we construct an inefficient adversary that simulates some builder strategy within the game and breaks the scheme by brute force breaking the underlying cryptographic primitive. Recall we consider black box reduct fully black box reductions, so we can consider inefficient adversaries. And this fact that it can break the underlying primitive allows the adversary to map any, pebbler, any reduction strategy into a pebbler strategy in the builder pebbler game. Let me conclude with some open problems. First, can we strengthen our lower bounds to hold also for rewinding or non-oblivious reductions, or can we use these techniques to overcome our lower bounds? We call that only in the setting of proxy encryption on complete tags, we have a complete answer to these questions. Second, of course, it would be interesting to see which other multi-round games can be captured by our Builder Pebbler game. And finally, whether one can use our idea of translating pebbling lower bounds into lower bounds and the loss in adaptive security also in other settings, such as constant round games like ABE or garbling, where the entire graph structure is known in the first round. In the setting of Yao's specific construction for garbling, we know the answer is yes, as we showed at crypto this year. However, we required very different techniques there. With this, let me thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Karen? All right, looks like there are no questions in the chat. Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you. All right, so next talk is on concurrent composition of differential privacy by Salir Vadan in Taiwan. And Tian Hao is going to give the talk. Uh, okay. Um, uh, hi, I'm Tian Hao. I'm a PhD student at Princeton. Um, today, I'll talk about our work on the concurrent composition of differential privacy. Um, so differential privacy is a dominant privacy notion nowadays. Um, the main idea of differential privacy is to carefully randomize the algorithm um, so that its output does not depend too much on any single individual in the data set. Um, that is, um, and for, for a differentially private mechanism, um, the probability distribution of the, the mechanism's output of a data set should be nearly identical to the distribution of its outputs on the same set with uh, any single individual's data being replaced. And the distribution closeness is characterized by parameters epsilon and delta. One of the most important properties of differential privacy is that it permits the analysis of cumulative privacy loss under the composition of multiple mechanisms. If we run multiple distinct differential privacy algorithms on the same data set, the resulting composed algorithm is also differentially private with some de degradation in the parameters epsilon delta for privacy guarantee. This property is especially important and useful since in practice, we rarely want to release only one single statistic about data set. Releasing many statistics may require running multiple and different kinds of differentially private algorithms on the same database. 
there are already many co composition theorems exist in the literature, and it, it has been shown how to compute the optimal bound for composing um, mechanisms. All of the existing composition theorems, however, focus on or implicitly assume that the underlying DP mechanisms are one-shot algorithms that only output one answer. However, many of the useful differential privacy primitives, such as sparse vector technique, are actually interactive mechanisms, which allow one to ask an adaptive sequence of queries um, about the data set. Um, for instance, sparse vector technique could potentially accept infinite amount of queries, while paying privacy cost only for queries that are greater than the noise threshold. Um, so we first uh, formally defined the interactive differential privacy as a type of interactive protocol between the adversary and an interactive mechanism. A natural question regarding interactive DP mechanism is whether the differential privacy is also preserved under composition. However, there could be more than one composition operations for interactive mechanisms. Um, the, most, the most straightforward one is sequential composition. Uh, where the adversary's interactive session with one mechanism must be halted before it starts an interactive session with another mechanism. In this case, all of the composition theorems we discussed earlier still applies. However, um, a reality strike is that a single adversary could interact with multiple mechanisms concurrently, um, where different threads of uh, the interactive sessions can be arbitrarily interleaved with each other. That is, Although the response outputs by different mechanisms are generated independently, and, uh, the adversary, however, may coordinate its actions it takes in various executions of uh, interactive sessions. And in particular, its actions in one execution may also depend on messages it received in other executions. Unfortunately, none of the existing composition theorems for non-interactive DP can be directly applied to the setting of concurrent compositions. Um, to the best of our knowledge, uh, this work is the first to tackle the problem of um, the concurrent composition of interactive differential privacy. Um, here are our main results. Um, we derive a bound that is similar to group privacy. For the concurrent composition of pure interactive DP, the privacy degrades at most linearly with the number of mechanisms concurrently executed. Uh, which is the same as non-interrupt DP. The proof is based on a hybrid argument. However, for the concurrent composition of approximate interrupted DP, uh, it is worse than even the basic composition theorem of non-interrupted DP uh, in the delta term. Um, we then characterize a pure interrupted DP mechanism as a post-processing of randomized response, uh, which is a non-interactive mechanism and obtain the optimal privacy bound for the composition of pure interrupt DP by taking the optimal composition of non-interrupted differential privacy, uh, since we know that DP is closed under post-processing. Um, unfortunately, we still don't know much about the, the concurrent composition of approximate interrupt DP. Uh, we believe the bound we got are far from the correct answer. Um, based on computer simulation, we conjecture that optimal composition bound uh, may uh, may also hold for approximate DP. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken Ho. Is there any question for Ken Ho? Okay, so we have no questions from the chat. All right, thank you, Ken Ho, again. Next talk is on the irreplaceability of global setups or how not to use a global ledger by Christian Badersher, sorry, Julia Hesse and Vasily Tsikas. And Julia is going to give the talk. Thanks, hi, everybody. OK, can you see the? You'll actually need to, um, under display settings up at the top, you will need to, I think it says reverse display. Uh, swap, swap presenter, sorry. Ah. Yes. How does this look? That looks good for us. Okay, so now my mouse is a bit gone, but... Ah, okay.
Can you see the laser pointer? Yes. Okay, awesome, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so hey everybody. Um, this paper is about uh, pitfalls in analyzing the security of protocols that run in concurrent systems. So let's assume we uh, want to capture the security of a protocol run between uh, Alice and Carol that requires some sort of uh, protocol setup, uh, for example, such as a public key infrastructure. Uh, in our work, we focus on setups that are modeled as uh, global, meaning that these setups are not exclusively available to um, this one protocol instance, but it can be, they can be accessed by other protocols uh, as well. Once a um, setup is deployed in practice, actually it is not, well, we do not really have any control over how users use it. For example, um, a uh, user might use a private key obtained from this PKI for more than just, uh, let's say, ECDSA signing. So to summarize, uh, global setups are in many cases a way more realistic uh, modeling than, uh, than local ones. Okay, so in, um, in recent years, um, blockchains have arised, uh, providing us with uh, publicly um, accessible or privately accessible immutable transaction ledgers. There are uh, many applications for this uh, new type of data structure, some uh, more serious, some less serious. And if you check the literature, many of these applications have a uh, security analysis in a simulation-based framework carried out with respect to a global ideal ledger functionality. Now, the whole point of the blockchain era is to not implement such an ideal ledger functionality by a trusted authority, but um, by a decentralized and interactive um, blockchain protocol emulating the, the trusted authority, right? So if we want to um, uh, want these proven security guarantees in the literature to be meaningful in practice, we need to be able to replace the global ideal ledger functionality in these statements by one of these protocols. So in this paper, we uh, investigate whether we can replace a global setup such as uh, a, tr a transaction ledger with another protocol while maintaining uh, the already proven security guarantees. Okay, so let's look at um, what happens uh, if we attempt to replace a global setup. Let's say we designed a protocol row um, for online poker and we have proven that it securely realizes some ideal functionality as poker um, assuming that the parties have access to a global ideal ledger, G ledger here. If we now replace the ideal ledger by the Bitcoin blockchain, um, for example, in our security statement, the following nasty thing happens. I want you to look at the, the um, interface of the simulator here in the ideal world. We see that the interface um, changes from the one at, at the, the G ledger functionality to the one at the Bitcoin protocol, right? Now the Bitcoin blockchain is known to securely realize an ideal ledger functionality, meaning that there are less attacks on the Bitcoin protocol than on G ledger. The interface of the simulator under replacement simply shrinks, shrinks here. And the simulator actually might run into failure. Okay, so failure of the simulator under replacement is clearly not a nice thing, right? It means essentially that um, our security proof does not carry over to the poker protocol as we would deploy it in, pract in practice, right? So accessing the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, so this is a problem. Uh, in 2014, Kennedy et al. Uh, demonstrated that, um, that uh, such simulation failure can essentially be avoided if the replaced protocol uh, is essentially equivalent to the ideal functionality, in particular, the adversarial interface. Mm, but of course, this had, has quite limited applications. And uh, for example, it does not work um, to replace a non-equivalent um, by a non-equivalent, uh, the, the, sorry, the ledger by a non-equivalent uh, blockchain protocol. So in our work, we find essentially more ways than equivalency to keep security statements valid under replacement of the global setup. And the intuition should be quite clear from the, from the kind of animation that I showed on the last slide. Um, the intuition is that we can replace whenever the simulation is not disturbed by the replacement. Okay, so our first composition theorem for replacing global setups uh, works for what we call agnostic simulations. This is a simulator who um, essentially only accesses the ledger as an honest party would do, right? So this means the simulator of the security proof for our poker protocol here, so this guy, 
it essentially just transmits um, uh, submits transactions um, on behalf of Alice and Carol to the ledger, right? So for global setups, which do not even provide an extra adversarial interface, this uh, theorem essentially yields black box composition, meaning that we do not even have to look into the simulator and can directly replace the global setup with any well, blockchain protocol realizing it. Um, the second composi composition theorem uh, for replacing global setups that we came up with can capture um, an even broader setting, but its preconditions are more tedious to check. We define a set of so-called admissible attacks, which are attacks that are allowed on both uh, the global ledger functionality and on Bitcoin. So for example, it might be possible for a network adversary to postpone publishing of an honest transaction in Bitcoin by one block, right? And hence we can unlock this kind of attack also for our poker simulator. Okay, so the flip side of our work is that these uh, theorems, these two, um, already make it quite clear that replacement of a, um, of a global setup in security statements really hinges on, well, on the optimality of the simulation. So to say it very clear, a security proof with a simulator who overly exploits the adversarial interface of the global setup will most likely not survive replacement of the global setup. Okay, so I hope I could get you interested in having a look at the extended talk and also please check out the paper, which is equipped with uh, lots of fun examples on how to use and how to not use global setups that you still have to replace. Thanks. Um, Thank you, Julia. Do we have any questions? Some question from the chat. Oh, maybe I have a quick question. So, so would you say there is a way to define the global ledger that is um, safe, so that will work for any that such a simulator cannot exploit it, whatever that means? That's a, that's a very good question, and I mean that's a question that we ask ourselves. Um, the thing is that you have there's another side to. Um, to what I just said, because you also need to prove that the Bitcoin protocol realizes that ledger, right? And you don't want this uh, ideal ledger functionality to be really close to the Bitcoin protocol because otherwise it will get like extremely long, right? So you want this ideal ledger functionality to be some abstraction of the Bitcoin protocol, meaning that you need to allow the adversary, for example, to do some reordering. Right. So it's always there's always these two sides. So on the one hand, we want to simplify the proof of a secure realization of the ideal letter. On the other hand, if we allow too much and this is exploited too much in the in the simulation of the application protocol, then I mean, replacement does not go through. Right. And so, yeah, what you say is is very valid for the letter. I cannot I mean, we cannot really, really answer this question in a nice way because there's really these two sides. And from, from what we, um, so we checked a lot of, uh, um, a lot of literature um, and it seems that most of the, most of the application, um, applications do not overly exploit um, these adversarial interfaces with only very few exceptions. Okay, thank you. Thank, I thank Julia again. Thank you. All right, last talk of the session is uh, polynomial time targeted attacks on coin tossing for any number of corruptions. This is a joint work by Omid, G, Said, Mohammed, and G is gonna give the talk. Yeah, thank you. So, um, hello everyone, welcome to the talk. Uh, I'm Zigo from University of Virginia. Today- G, can you speak louder or closer to the mic? Is that better? Slightly better. Uh, okay. But I mean, actually, maybe I can increase the, the speakers here. Okay, try now. Okay, uh, hello, everyone. Okay, let's, let's continue like this. So, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. I am Zigo from University of Virginia. Today I will present our paper, Polynomial Time Targeted Attack on Coin Tossing for Any Number of Corruptions. 
And this is joint work with Amir, Saeed, and Muhammad. And this talk is about collective coin tossing. So let's see this example of, for such protocol. Now here are n parties, and each of them send out a single message. And eventually, the protocol takes all these n messages and returns the output bit B, which equals one with probability mu. Note that although in general parties can send more than one messages, in this work we focus on attacking this single message protocol. As we will see, it's already very general and leads to interesting applications. Here we define the attack model. We focus on what we call targeted key replacing attacks. Targeted means the addresser prefers output one, and key replacing means that it can corrupt and replace up to k messages with its choices after seeing the original values chosen by these parties. So for example, in this protocol at, at round one, party one gives this message omega one, but adversary after seeing this omega one decide to replace it to omega one prime. And at round two, party two prepares this omega two and uh, it can depend on the previous omega one prime. But this time the adversary decide not to replace this message. And finally at round n, after pay, uh, party n prepare to send this omega n message, it could depend on all the previous broadcast messages and the adversary changes the message to omega n prime. The success of this adversary is measured by how much it can increase the probability of putting one. And more formally, the gain is mu prime minus mu, where mu prime is the probability of b equals one after the attack and mu is the probability of b equals one without the attack. Assume we have a protocol pi between n parties and protocol b equals one is mu. We now ask the following question. With a fixed budget k, how much gain can the adversary achieve? We study the question for two classes of protocols. On the flat first class, messages are uniform binary, and on the second class, messages are arbitrarily long. The first class is clearly a special case of the second class. Now suppose beta tn is the probability of a hamming ball, which is simply the probability of the summation of uniform binary bits omega 1 or 2 omega n. For the case of uniform binary messages, we show that for the original probability mu equals to beta tn, even polynomial time online attacks can achieve probability mu prime, which is equals to the beta t minus kn, a bigger Hamming ball. This implies the threshold protocol is optimal for Hamming ball probabilities, and as a result, we obtain this computational and online variant of Harper's vertex as a parametric inequality. And for the case of arbitrary message length, we show that polynomial time online attacks can achieve this gain omega mu times k over root n. And this implies that the threshold protocol is optimal up to a constant for constant mu for large messages as well. And because of allowing this large messages as application, this result allows one to obtain this targeted poisoning attack on deterministic machine learning learners with a small budget k. When, that is small o root n when n is size of training data set. And for the case of uniform binary messages, as a related work, this Lichtenstein et al. 1989 paper showed that the threshold functions are optimal for a weaker adversary model in which the adversary cannot see the message before de deciding to make these changes. Um, their attack is not polynomial time. For arbitrary messages, a series of work starting with a uh, Kali et al. show that uh, how to obtain polynomial time attacks using larger budget, which well, by larger we mean that this k equals to omega root n. Instead, um, their, their analysis use these works uh, lead to no gain when k is uh, small o uh, root n. However, know that uh, here we want to understand optimal attacks for every possible k. We now describe some ideas between. Uh, sorry, we now de describe some idea behind the proofs of our two results, starting with the case of uniform binary messages. Now we dis describe our first result in a more details. Uh, suppose the messages are all uniformly binary. Consider this T threshold protocol in which parties let this output be B to be one if the sum of the bits is larger than T. Consider a more powerful attack, which we call offline. So it wait to say all the messages and then re make a replacement. It is easy to say such attacks can increase the probability of the output of one to a larger Hamming ball. And the Harper's vertex isoparametric inequality show that one can always achieve the same gain when the probability B equals one is the probability of Hamming ball. 
our first result is to improve this classical result to show that uh, the same can be achieved even if the attack is limited to be online. So it cannot see the future bits and runs in the polynomial time. To, to get uh, some more details of this proof, here's a figure of the different adversary scale for n equals to 10. In this figure, x-axis is the mu value that ranges from zero to one, and the y-axis is the adversary's maximum gain that it can achieve for every protocol for given mu. The blue curve is the maximum gain for the online adversary, which we want to bound. The red curve is the maximum gain of the offline adversary, which is basically the isoparametric bound. We know that the blue curve is always below the red curve, but we don't know how much. Observe that somehow magically at this exact Hamming ball probability, what we prove is always the case. To do so, we connect these points on this red curve that correspond to the exact Hamming ball probabilities using these straight lines. This gives a piecewise linear function L, which we prove to be a lower bound on the blue curve as well. Doing so means that this red and blue curve will have the same uh, result on this Hamming ball probabilities. And to prove that, this L curve is indeed a lower bound. Uh, we use this induction on N, and the induction crucially relies on the concavity of this L function. Our high-level approach here is inspired by recent work of Horiscani et al., but actual induction step is quite different. Now we go over ideas behind our at attack in, for the case for arbitrary lens messages. Suppose at round i, uh, adversary is given this message uh, omega 1 to omega i minus 1 and current message omega i, and the adversary wants to decide whether to replace this omega i or not. Basically, we use this additive game adversary that is similar to this attack in MM out 19 paper, which makes this replacement when the current additive gain is large, that namely at this message omega i, let alpha be the probability before the attack of uh, uh, b equals one and alpha prime be the maximum pro possible probability of b equals one by replacing this omega i to any other message omega i star at this step. So if this alpha prime minus alpha larger or equal to lambda, the address will replace this omega i to omega i star. This paper has proved that the attacks start to gain when k is large. There is also a multiplicative, multiplicative gain adversary from at Sami et al. So that paper that gives this even shorter bound using this multiplicative gain adversary. However, what we want is to have an attack works for any k, and that's not provided by these two papers. Here we show that this additive gain adversary, as opposed to this multiplicative variant of this attack, can lead to a good gain even if we cut this attack for any number k. We prove this result by using this reduction uh, induction on this k. All we need to do is to gain the k case replacement. In summary, we show that either this happened or something is even better happens. So if the case replacement happens, adversary gains lambda. So this is only true for additive attacks. So if the case replacement does not happen, it means the budget of adversary is not fully used then the output will be indistinguishable for another attack, which has even bad, even larger budget, maybe infinity budget. And of course, it's an extremely strong one. So it's a win-win situation for the adversary. So we summarize our findings in the conclusion. For the uniform binary protocols, threshold protocol is optimal for online and offline K-replacing attacks and for any K. And this result can be viewed as a computational version of Harper's vertex as a parametric inequality. And for protocols with any message lens, the majority protocol is still optimal up to a constant factor. This result can be applied to obtain generic targeted poisoning attacks on machine learners with small budget. Thank you. I appreciate any questions and comments from you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the? By the way, am I? Pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, I see no questions from the audience. And no questions from the chat. All right, so let's thank every speaker of this session. Uh, we are